Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Ju K. Su. I'm the founder of C4Q, and our mission is to foster the Queen Tech ecosystem. Um, we really want to help support both companies and entrepreneurs to help make Queens and specific law and city into a cluster for innovation and entrepreneurship. And also, we have uh, programs um, to help expand the pipeline of talent to tech, particularly helping you know, low-income minority communities here in Queens and linking more people to opportunities in tech and helping um, grow the tech sector here in New York. I'm so happy for um, all of you guys to come here tonight. We have um, the kickoff of this Fireside Chat speaker series, so you get kind of uh, inside track and hear from experiences of uh, entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists about their experience and what they're doing to build their companies. We hope it's a, it's a great event. Love your feedback. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming. And we'd like to thank Verizon as well for sponsoring this event, as well as a series of events just to support more exposure to tech entrepreneurship here in Queens. And uh, with that, uh, here's Aaron. I've got this one. We've got two mics now. We're super advanced. Can everyone hear me all right? This is OK? Great. OK. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Aaron Cohen. Um, I am the co-chair of the Coalition for Queens Tech Events Committee. Um, first of all, who's here for the first time? OK, that's awesome. We love it when we see new people get involved. And I can actually well, here or in, in Queens, you know, presumably this event or this space at least. Um, so uh, yeah, um, we're building the tech community here in Queens. Uh, one of the ways we do that is with events like this. Um, I also host the Queens Tech Meetup, which is more of an opportunity for startups to show off products as opposed to talk about themselves and you know, the journey that got them here. Um, whereas tonight, we're here to talk with a Queens-based startup CEO, Brian Schimmerlich from Vengo, uh, one of his earliest invest investors, Mark Walken, um, as well as someone from Verizon. This is Dan Wolf, everybody. He's a solutions architect. Um, not only is Verizon an incredible sponsor of Coalition for Queens, but they also worked with Brian in the early stages to integrate their technology into that thing. Um, so if you're wondering what a Vengo is, and I'm sure Brian will talk about this at length shortly, um, it's basically an internet-connected vending machine um, that can go just about anywhere you could fit something about that size. Um, and you know, one of the things that Verizon will be here to talk about as well is how um, you know, their technology made that possible. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I've been building startups and digital projects in the New York City community uh, for a little more than six years. Um, I work on the business development team at a mobile dev shop called Fueled. Um, I'm also proud to report I run the newest venture division of any organization in New York, officially incorporated as of two weeks ago. So I don't think we have any new venture, uh, venture capital uh, outfits yet. Um, so we invest in some of the products we work for, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about these guys. Um, so Brian, why don't you introduce yourself and we can do introductions all the way around and then we'll go into a little more formal QA session. My name is Brian Schimmerlich. I'm the CEO of Vengo. We work right around the corner, so we're really happy to be here. Um, we build mini high-tech vending machines. Um, we build them completely from scratch. We do all the mechanical, electrical, software work. Uh, we build them in-house in, in, uh, in Queens. Um, and in about two years, we've gone from concept to 50 vending goes deployed in the field. Um, we're about to build a batch of 250, and uh, we're working real hard trying to make as much progress as we can every day. Um, so look forward to telling you more about it and the the day to day. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Walken. I wear two hats currently. I am uh, a managing director at Dream Adventures, the accelerator program. People here familiar with with Dream It? Generally, no. Some people. Okay, yeah, uh, you know, Dream It's an accelerator program where companies apply and we provide capital and office space and speakers and advisors and all that good stuff to let you accomplish in three months what it might normally take you 12 or 18 months to do on your own. And we have programs in New York, Philly, Austin, and, and Baltimore. So, uh, and we actually just finished our most recent New York cycle uh, last week. We had our demo day for that. So, uh, lots of cool companies if uh, you want to check out some of the good amount of press about that, so you might want to check those out too. 
Um, none from Queens, but maybe next time. <laughs> Although maybe they'll move to Queens, we'll hope. Uh, so, uh, so that's one thing. And then I also have my own uh, early stage fund called Upstage Ventures, where I invest in early stage companies, including Van Gogh. Um, but from about half B2B, half B2C, uh, the B2B stuff tends to be focused, uh, with this being kind of an exception, but ten, although not completely as I'll describe later, but things that are in the optimization analytics type space, which is really the space I know best. Previously, before I did all this, I had my own company that, called Optimost that I founded and, and eventually sold that did, it was basically a multivariate testing platform for, for enterprise, for large enterprises. Um, so the B2B stuff tends to be like that. The B2C stuff is a little more eclectic, really more focused on just things that you know, I'm passionate about. So my investments on that side include places like uh, SeatGeek uh, here in the city, uh, YouNow, which is another one here in New York, uh, Puzzle Social, which is a gaming thing. So uh, a wide variety of things, but typically almost exclusively New York-based companies is what I, what I focus on. So good evening, everyone. Dave Wolf, uh, manager of a solutions architect here, here with Verizon Wireless. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Verizon for uh, going on nine years now in a capacity, um, and well, actually I'd say in a number of capacities, but over that time I've had the opportunity to support you know, customers in the B2B space across SMB, across enterprise, working closely with several government agencies. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to partner with customers in the Fortune 500 space, but also brand new startups that are looking to innovate and develop new and exciting products, our goal is to work with those customers and help them to realize the benefits and the power of the Verizon Wireless Network. You know, how can we help them to expand their footprint and expand their presence when attracting their customer base? So again, Dave Wolf, manager of the Solutions Architects for New York here in uh, the region. Um, thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, so got a couple questions here that I think are most present because the one thing we really want to get across at these events, which by the way, this is the first time we've done it in this format. Usually we do sort of tech demos and show off the product, but you know, I want to tell a story here. And that is basically why is Queens a good place to start your new startup? Um, so Brian can obviously speak to that from the entrepreneurial perspective. I hope Mark can speak to um, how that informs his decision as an investor. Um, and I think Verizon might have something to say about that as well because they have to make strategic choices about where to place infrastructure. Um, be that wireless spectrum that the Vango systems use or be it fiber or whatever it may be. Um, so why don't we start with Brian. Um, you know, why did you start your company in Queens? Sure, so for us as sort of the Internet of Things, hardware, solution, it's tough because all of the incredible amount of co-working spaces, they don't, you don't really have a door that you can close and sort of lock things up. Um, so we looked around at a bunch of uh, the co-working spaces and we found this place right around the corner in LaGuardia Community College called New York Designs. And it's essentially one of the only co-working spaces where you can close the door and have a private office. We have a thousand square feet private office and we pay $2,000. So just for reference, that will get you three desks in an open area at WeWork. So actually, at my co-working space, it'll get you less than three desks. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so I mean, we're thrilled about it. It's, uh, we definitely get a few people who are like, you know, I can't come out to Long Island City. It's not in Manhattan. Um, but generally, it's pretty ignorant because it takes, from the Upper East Side, it takes me less time to get here than to really go to like Soho, certainly the financial district. So it's super easy, it's one stop on the subway. Um, it's just nice to feel like you have space. Um, the lunch options could use uh, some help, but um, there's a couple good spots. Absolutely, what, you don't, you don't like the cafeteria at, at LaGuardia Community College? No. Uh, too bad. Before Coalition for Queens made its, uh, planted its flag here and, and started this space, um, we were actually housed in, in the same co-working space. So that's how I first met Brian. I was working day to day at Coalition for Queens last year. Um, and I can personally attest that the New York design space is, is unprecedented in, in, in the terms of the space that it can afford companies. Um, so it's a pretty unique co-working space in that it has offices and Wi-Fi and a ping pong table. Um, but it actually has a whole floor, machine shop, 
you know, fabrication facilities. Um, I think the whole building used to be a Nabisco factory, right? So, you know, it, it's more or less the same sort of feel that this building has right here. And, you know, you get the sense that this is still very raw and under development. But, you know, to me, this is just opportunity. And I think that, you know, Brian sees the same way there. Um, how about Mark? Do you have any insights into, you know, did it cross your mind when you invested in Vengo that they were going to be based outside of Manhattan? You know, it was, were you thinking like, well, now I have to venture into the wilderness or? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, I would say it really, I mean, honestly, it didn't even cross my mind. In fact, I'm not even sure when I first found out about Brian that I even knew that he was based in Queens. I don't know if he was trying to hide that, <laughs> but not that, I, you know, honestly, I don't think it really would have made much of a difference from an investor standpoint. I mean, it's still, I mean, look, if he, if he was, you know, way the hell out by, you know, City Field, then, then maybe that would, might have, I mean, it still probably wouldn't even necessarily have been, in, been an issue, but, um, you know, I think that from an investor standpoint, as long as uh, you feel that the entrepreneur, I mean, look, I mean, I mean, hopefully eventually, you know, Queens becomes the center of the universe for all things, you know, tech. It's not, not there yet, but hopefully it's, it's you know, it's, 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 uh, it's certainly up and coming without a question. I think as long as from an investor standpoint, you feel that, you know, if um, the company, if, if being part of the New York tech ecosystem or even beyond the tech ecosystem, just the advertising or, or whatever kinds of things. And, you're gonna, and as long as you feel like the entrepreneur is going to be able to get to New York you know, easily, I, as, as, as Brian said, I think realistically it it's probably is going to be a little harder to get people to come out to you. Um, and that's really not just Queens. I mean, it's the same even with Brooklyn, even with how Brooklyn has become today. It's still, I think sometimes there's still a mentality of, oh, I got to go to Brooklyn. Or even, or even, or even right now with DreamAid. I mean, we were down this year on on Wall Street, uh, which is still even Manhattan, and even just getting people to go to the financial district can be uh, can be a stretch. So it's not even necessarily something unique to, to Queens. But I think as a startup, I think that's okay because really more of your time is going to be spent going to customers or going to the investor's office. And sure, an investor might want to see what your your office space looks like at some point. But the reality is, it's I don't think it's really that that critical from an investor standpoint. It's it's probably more of an issue in terms of attracting talent. Uh, you know, because there might be some bias that some people might have of, oh, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, have to work out in Queens. And um, but, but again, if, if you're if you have something great and and you're you can really sell your vision, um, and I think you know there there is still a mindset of, of people understanding that it, how close it really is. I mean, I was actually timing it just because I didn't completely know if I believed Aaron when he told me that it was 14 minutes on the uh, on the subway from Grand Central, and uh, indeed it was. So I give you credit for that. Um, although I did have to switch because I got on the express, so I didn't, I didn't anticipate I, that. I should have warned everybody. I hope no one got lost all the way to 61st Street. Um, there is an express train around this time that will completely skip the stop. But uh, right. if anything, that shows that someone's committed to getting people in and out of Queens more <laughs> right. efficiently. But, but, I mean, the truth is, I mean, that's exactly as much time it takes me to get down to Dream It from Grand Central to, to Wall Street. So it's, it's, almost, it's almost the identical thing. And in some ways, it was nicer coming out here because at least for half the subway, you actually have Internet access, which is kind of neat. Because you're above ground, so uh, it, you know there's still that mind shift, uh, you know, mindset change that I think is still evolving. But but you know, as far as you know, raising capital and all that, I really don't think. I mean, it had no impact on my decision, and I think uh, I don't think for most investors it should really make be, be something that hampers you. I think I like the idea that he, that Brian's only spending a thousand dollars or whatever he said, two thousand dollars a month for a lot of space. That's certainly a great thing. Yeah. Do you? Do you work, you know, with clients in particular territories? Do you work only with clients in Queens? Do you work with clients all over? You know, how does the client's location versus, you know, this thing goes anywhere? So we know that obviously Verizon's network is hovering everywhere. Um, how does Verizon work with a company in Queens versus versus somewhere else? Great question. So you know, Verizon Wireless, being a, a national organization, we've got presence really across the United States. Uh, but specifically here, in what we call you know the, the New York metro area, which is the city, uh, New Jersey. I'm sorry, there's a fly floating around here. But uh, <laughs> specifically here within the city, the outer boroughs, Long Island, we've got designated teams and dedicated teams that are here to support the local presence. You know, kind of the feet on the street, if you will, to help drive that innovation and partner very closely with these organizations. So, you know, especially here in the Queens area, um, you know, you spoke before about the you know the um, the booming presence here in the outer boroughs, you know, Queens, Brooklyn, there's a lot of innovation that's happening. There's a lot of startups that are coming through. 
So it's a lot of uh, excitement. There's a lot of you know, very interesting projects for us to partner with the potential customers on. Uh, and we, you know, again, we have a, a dedicated team here that's designated full time to supporting the local presence. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think this is a good segue back to Brian here. Why don't you talk to a little bit more about how exactly this thing works? What inside of it allowed you to just, you took it out of a box and all you had to do was plug it into the wall and now it works. Presumably it's connected, it's online, it can accept credit cards, you know. How does this whole thing work out of the box? Yeah, so this is our third generation Vengo. Um, we're close to launching the fourth generation. Uh, and we've done all of that in, in a couple of years. So the screen is an 18 inch uh, HD touchscreen. And it's actually a Dell tablet that um, in some ways we sort of hacked together um, and to, to control and make it our own as we were still sort of in that you know, startup phase. Um, and so it's a computer that controls the whole thing. Um, it's connected via a cradle point, which is a tiny little hotspot. Um, for us, we're trying to figure out the right connectivity solution, it was a little harder because usually the kiosks are like you picture in the grocery store on your way out and there's just tons and tons of room. And so for us, it was we were looking for something super space efficient, right? So we believe that we fit as much product in as little space as is humanly possible. Um, we have a team of aerospace engineers. Uh, Kevin and Sean from our team are here. Um, and we've just totally designed it from scratch and tried to sort of flip the switch in terms of the operations. So if you've ever seen someone restock a vending machine, they're on their knees outside the machine, they're surrounded by all these huge boxes, they've got a dolly, they're counting the cash. Um, and so we try to minimize the in the field time. So we designed this cartridge system where all the restocking happens in, in an efficient way at the warehouse. And in the field, you just swipe your card, the door pops open, we're notified, uh, you pull out cartridges, you put in cartridges, you close it. There's no cash. It's all credit card and digital payment. Uh, and we manage everything remotely. So every single touch of the screen, uh, we can track. So you can see the little dots here, maybe. Uh, we track every touch. And basically, we are bringing an online level of analytics into the physical world and coupling it with point of purchase. So we are creating retail. Um, we run different sort of interactive promotions that you would not expect to see on your traditional vending machine. Uh, we work closely with Uber, Long Island City based. Hey, hey. Um, so have you ever used Uber before? Yes, I enter my phone number. Submit, and not only do I get an instant text via Twilio, but you get a discount on all the products. Um, so really trying to make it more engaging, more fun, and change that experience that people picture of a vending machine. Very, very cool. So do you think we might see one of these in an Uber sometime in the future or similar conveyance? Yeah, we're working closely with them. Um, not, I'm not joking, this is gonna sound made up, but we actually did reach out to them and be like, hey, we work around the corner, um, can we come by sometime? And now we're doing a, uh, you know, a paid acquisition model, driving downloads of the Uber app, um, and uh, we've also worked closely with Songza. Um, Another Queens-based startup? Yeah, so th when they got acquired by Google, we reached out and we were like, hey, congratulations, <laughs> we wanna come over, and they, um, they invited us over. Um, so, and maybe Dan, you can speak to this as well. I mean, you take this thing out of the box, you plug it in, and that's pretty much it, right? You don't have to do anything else, it gets online right away? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's a cradle point inside of it, and okay. as the power flows through, it gets powered up. Um, these are generally wall mounted, so it can look pretty smooth, like no wires coming out. Um, and then this is just an actual, like a $90 uh, normal tripod you'd use for a camera. Uh, and we sort of retrofitted a bracket, so it sort of accentuates how thin this is. So this is six inches deep. And that's sort of the invasiveness into an environment, right? And so usually a vending machine is. And so we, our sort of sales pitch to locations 
is we will take two square feet of completely unused space and we'll turn it into this amenity to give people things that they want and stay in your space. I, I think the statistic is that in the United States, two people a year are actually crushed by vending machines. Has that ever happened with one of these? Or you think ever could? I think, I think we could take it. <laughs> good to know, good to know. So Dan, why don't you talk about working with Brian and um, you know, what, sh what, what did Verizon have to do you know, to get Van Gogh online anywhere they take one of these things? So I think anytime we work with a customer, we always have to start off with understanding what's important to them. Uh, you know, so the story probably goes back a year and a half ago to when the team first started working with Brian um, and you know, understanding what the goal really was in mind. And when you take a product like Van Gogh, where you know, he can't, he, again, he mentioned you know, the, the minimal space that that device really takes up and the advantage that, that can bring to a prospective client. You know, part of that, and part of that advantage, I would say, is being able to, you know, quote unquote, cut the cord. So being able to leverage, you know, the Verizon wireless network, uh, being able to, you know, tap into the, the 4G LTE network that we've invested in, you know, nationally and especially here within the New York metro area, you know, allows him the opportunity to, you know, really extend his potential footprint into new potential locales or client locations. And that's really, you know, the, the goal that we have in mind when we're working with our prospective customers. You know, understanding how the Verizon Wireless Network and how the Verizon Wireless team can partner with them to help innovate, drive growth, and you know, help introduce their product into more venues uh, to help drive growth and drive revenue. Very cool, very cool. Um, so I think now we might be able to switch to questions from the audience time. Um, anyone have a particular question that you'd like to ask? Sure. Uh, so I've used it once, and it's awesome. Uh, we can start from that. And so one uh, question which I had thought about, you know, when using this is is that if you look at a larger vending uh, machine, right, uh, you have more real estate, which means that you can hold more stuff in it, right, and which also means that you have to refuel it less often. Uh, how much of a problem has that been for you of refueling it? And who is responsible for that, right? And how do you manage that logistics? Sure. Thanks for the question. So it's, it's a question we get a lot. Um, and when we talk to the people in the traditional vending industry, they don't get it at all. And they don't really like it. Um, and, and they're an industry that's sort of accustomed to doing things the old way. And it's, a, it's big. It's a $17 billion industry. Um, so as we lower, you know, we think about it in terms of like a turnover of the machine, right? There has to be enough margin on the turnover to fund the economics of the restock. And, you know, then you calculate the, after all the costs, the payback on the machine. Um, as we have a lower capacity, we deal with that in a few ways. Uh, one, as I mentioned before, it is an extremely efficient restock. So this restock takes about one minute versus a traditional restock that takes about 20 minutes. And so there's a lot of time. Now, we did not want to be in the business of restocking vending machines. You just really don't get paid for it. Um, and so we sort of position ourselves as the software design tech company that manages the machines and works with brands to do point of purchase digital media. Um, so we partner with the second largest traditional vending machine company. We outsource the restocking. And because of the technology, we can manage it remotely really efficiently. Um, so they already have all the people going around. They have the manpower, the insurance, the vehicles. And so the marginal cost to restock our machines is pretty low. And so it's, it really is a nice fit where we're paying them a percentage of revenue um, we, we had our bi-monthly meeting this morning. They're happy, we're happy. It costs us less than to do it ourselves. They're making marginal revenue. Uh, we also, last thing, we focus on higher ticket items. So vending machines, you generally spend a dollar. Um, maybe you, you go nuts and go for the Frappuccino for 225, but we're, we're focusing on higher ticket items. We mix it in. We sell chargers for $25. We sell uh, really high quality headphones for under 10, um, Advil for $4.50, and so that helps the unit economics. What, what's your most popular item to date? Uh, it, 
It used to be Sour Patch Kids. I would say that. I would say Snickers probably took it over. Kev, you agree? Kev's our data master, so he built the whole back end that tracks everything. So at the end of the day, it's still candy. But yeah, so Snickers is the most popular purchased item in the US in a vending machine. The second most popular, does anyone want to guess? Contraceptives. <laughs> There's actually not so many in vending machines. Uh, next most popular is Cool Ranch Doritos. Back. Good to know. Good to know what you'll learn at Queens Tech. Um, do we have any more questions for anyone on the panel? Dan, what do you think? Question for Mark. When you were getting pitched by Brian as an investor, what was the, the thing you were most excited about? And then maybe your biggest fear, and if that's changed at all in two years. So well, let's see. When I was, when I, I guess when I was pitched, and I, I was originally, I think, introduced to Brian via Frank Rimolovsky, I believe. Frank is runs the New York NYU uh, investment fund, and I've known Frank for a long time. And he said, "Hey, I got this really cool company. It's a little, it's a little out there. It's a vending machine thing, <laughs> uh, but you know, but Brian's really awesome. You should you should check it out." So you know, so um, I trust Frank, and I, I met with Brian, and um, you know, I think there were a few things that that impressed me. Uh, you know, the first thing was, and this is, I think, with, with all investors, really, the, the first thing is certainly the, the, you, the first thing you look for are the people and the team. And, and, uh, and I, was, I was very impressed with Brian just as a, as a scrappy entrepreneur. I mean, he showed up at our first meeting with, you know, he used to lug around, I don't know, he probably still does, this giant, if you could see the giant suitcase that this thing comes in. So just the fact that he would show up in a meeting and come, you know, <laughs> all the way across town with this giant suitcase was, was, was pretty impressive. Um, but, but um, you know, I, I think the, the, the things about uh, the, it, it was interesting certainly just by being something different instead of just yet another social media business, you know, here was something that was, that was a, little, a little novel and, and wasn't the type of thing where there were going to be 20 other companies that if I looked on AngelList or TechCrunch, I could find 20 other companies that were doing something very similar. It was obviously somewhat, somewhat unique, so that was interesting. But I think the, the, the the, the things that are that uh, that you know for me personally that that resonated and Brian kind of alluded to this uh, before and and I mentioned it a little in my background was that the uh, that this idea of, of it being a connected connected machine that was that was uh, always updatable always optimizable maybe not with the actual products that are in it on a split second but certainly with the pricing and the promotions and the advertisements the fact that you could really optimize this experience me was was pretty fascinating and and was something that you really uh, you know couldn't easily do with a lot of other uh, couldn't do at all with with most vending machines and, and certainly it wasn't something that I think was 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 really something that was really thought through very thoughtfully as it was with Brian so th so that was one piece the other thing was that I think he really understood I was impressed with how he had really modeled this out in terms of from a unit economic standpoint some of the things that Brian just talked about in terms of the costs of, of Everything from manufacturing these things to restocking them to what is the, the gross margins on these things, how many uh, items he would have to sell per month per um, machine, you know, all the stuff he he had really um, built out a model that that seemed very believable, uh, and and you know it, it wasn't that it was like this you know crazy 40, 40 sheet Excel document, but it was it was you know four or five uh, you know the, the, the key parts of the of the story that were really going to make or break this thing. I mean he was. Very thoughtful about, and and you know the assumptions were believable, and uh, you know it, it seemed like it wasn't just something he had kind of thrown together without thinking about. So, you know, so those were all interesting things. Uh, you know, as far as things I was concerned about, uh, it, it it was I think this was the first hardware thing I'd ever done. So, um, you know, the fact that um, there, there were you know you actually have to, there was manufacturing actually building something. You know, I think at first you know probably was you know a little bit of a concern, but. I think Brian impressed me that he had he had built up a great team. He was able to show me uh, working at that time. It was still prototype, but it you know it worked, and he had this kind of innovative canister system, that the cartridge system that he talked about. So uh, I think between the the team that he has had assembled and the fact that he actually had prototyped something that actually worked, I think you know allowed me to overcome some of those probably reservations I had about doing something that was more hardware related. Great. Okay. Um, any more questions? We're here. Let me. Let's go this way, like Oprah swimming through the crowd. 
Hi, uh, my name is Ben Reich. I'm a Queens native, and now I run a startup in, uh, in DC. Um, and I've been really impressed with the supportive and tenacious startup community there. Um, so I'd be, I'm curious to hear more about um, Queens specifically. So from Brian, you know, what, what do you think? Um, you know, were really the, 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 the things that allowed your startup to get off the ground here in New York, was it the recruiting easier? Was it easier to get meetings, like you said, with Uber and Starbucks? Was that really the X factor, and do you think it would have been possible elsewhere? And uh, for Mark also, you know, I know um, I, I saw Dream It is in a couple other cities, but it sounds like you're really focused on New York in, in, in your investments. I was wondering if, if you could explain a little bit more why you know, you're, why, you're, why you're so New York focused when so many of our technologies allow us to, to build these things location agnostic. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll try to hit on all of those. So in terms of getting started, um, we leveraged the New York ecosystem. We found this competition run by the city government called New York City Next Idea 2012. Um, the 270 companies, we took down the whole thing, and we got a ton of attention because of it um, at a point where it was completely concept. Uh, we had absolutely nothing. We weren't ready for it. Um, and so that got us the sort of 17 grand of seed capital that allowed us to build a prototype. Um, I was in business school, so I had absolutely no money. So the 17 grand was like a ton of money. Um, and so we turned that prototype into a seed round and we, and we got launched. Um, and so certainly without that level of competitions and, and stuff going on here, we couldn't have done it. Uh, in terms of Long Island City, what I've found um, is, you know, it's smaller, right? And so when you find another startup here, you have more in common as opposed to people being like, oh, we're both in Manhattan. You know, if you're here as opposed to at, you know, the New York tech meetup with thousands and thousands of people. So I found, you know, reaching out to Uber and Songza, who are, you know, pretty big dogs in the, in the tech community, um, just completely open, like, come on in. Uh, and so I was, I was really happy about that. So I think the second part of the question for Mark had something to do with, you know, do you only focus, do you only invest in New York companies? You know, is that, I think that's what it comes down to, yeah. Yeah, so the reason for that is, and you're right in, in, to the, in the, you know, that certainly with technology, where you are maybe matters less. I think that that is true. For me, the reason why I prefer companies that are in New York, or at least, you know, within short distance of New York, is, is more because, for me at least, when I, when I invest in companies, I try to invest in things that, uh, or, or try to be, more, I, I, more than just writing a check and just saying, you know, here's some money, you know, good luck, but want to be able to hopefully provide value in other ways through my own experiences as, as having, you know, been an entrepreneur and, and built a company and hopefully I can share some value with that. Um, and, you know, the reality is I, it's, it's, there's really no, I, I still think there's, well, while you can use Skype and you can use all these other types of things, uh, there's still, you know, still, there's still something about an in-person meeting that, that you know, can't be replaced. I think by by anything. So for me, I find that I'm able to be more involved with the companies, um, to probably feel closer to the companies when when they're when they're ones that, even though it's not like I'm going, you know, it's not like I'm meeting Brian every every week or anything like that. But there, there's still something just about the idea that you know, if we wanted to get together, or if we want, it wouldn't be like, oh, you know, when are you going to be in town? Am I going to be in town there? It's something that's much easier to coordinate, and and you know there ha I have done some investments in other in you know in companies in other places, and you know certainly when you get you know very involved, uh, you know in some cases where I'm on the board of a company, uh, I'm not in the case of Vengo, but but you know I certainly find that with with boards and all that, uh, there is there is uh, certainly a big you know you become you can be much more involved and much more. Uh, involved with a meeting and have much more of an influence on the meeting when, you know, when you're sitting there as opposed to when you're the guy on speakerphone and you start talking and you're interrupting people and, oh, you go, you go, and it's just, you know, it just doesn't, it, it's just not, it's not the same. You miss a lot of the nonverbal what's going on in the meeting. So, so it's really driven more by, by my, my interest in, in, in being able to be personally involved than that you can't be successful anywhere else. Um, 
you know, that's mainly it. I mean, I, I also am from New York originally, so I, I, there is an element of certainly that. I, I am a big boost of the New York tech scene. Um, New York, you know, in tech, New York is like the only place where New York is like the underdog. So there is that element of I want to see New York be successful. And so I do have that little bit of a bias, I guess, as well. Nothing against DC. But very, very, uh, very well put, Mark. Um, next question. This question sorry, is for Brian. I think you answered uh, part of uh, my question, but I was going to ask how early or late into the project did you raise the initial funding? You say you raised uh, 17000 as a seed capital, but how did you have a plan? Did you say, when I get to this stage, then I'm going to uh, raise some money? Sure. So our timeline was I started uh, business school at Stern in the fall of 2011. And I came up with the idea that every taxi in New York absolutely must have a vending machine in it. Uh, we pitched a one of the large fleet owners who owns 300 medallions at, at a million a piece. And he basically was like, kid, get lost. I don't care about you at all. And so we went home and we found the competition run by the government. We applied. Um, and so this was the first round was due like in at the end of October. And we applied, and I, you know, I was still working on it. It was definitely, definitely still concept stage. Um, and then as we got to keep going through the levels of the competition, kept trying to make as much progress as possible, uh, found a couple partners, started designing things in uh, 3D models uh, in CAD. And we won the competition in March of 2012. Um, and so we got that 17,000. And then it was like, okay, we've got some money. It's not, a, it's not a lot, but let's try to see what we can do with it. And so we had a whole team that had a lot of equity and no cash compensation. And we turned it into first a, a concept demonstrator. That was like this wooden box. Did I ever show that to you? You're lucky you didn't see that. It was like a, a, a wooden box where we glued a button on and you pressed the button and it made items release. And so it was just like a step. Um, and then we actually made a, a pretty, I'd say it looked better than it actually performed, a uh, prototype where we, we found someone at a metal shop to make us a shell and we 3D printed like everything inside and it barely worked, but it worked enough to go see Mark across town and make something drop out. Um, and so with that prototype, we were able to raise a million dollar seed round. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without a prototype. And um, with that million dollar seed round, we got to the point where we had uh, 50 Vengos uh, essentially deployed. And we raised a $2 million Series A, uh, which, which was still very difficult. Um, and now we've kind of expanded our staff a little and we're working on our next production run. So I think that's the sort of fundraising early stage textbook right there, you know. 17K to 1 million, it went from 17 to 1 million. Okay, so no, no thing smaller in between. Wow, who'd have thought? Um, any more questions over here? One right here? Uh, how f I'm just curious, how far along are uh, Verizon's Fios and LT rollouts in Queens? Can you repeat that question one more time? I apologize. I think the question was, uh, how developed is the LTE network in Queens? Um, and do you have additional, did you say additional development or? Bio, Fios. Oh, you want to talk about Fios. Do you work with Fios at all? I think he wants to know when he's going to get Fios at his house because he does not like Time Warner, it sounds like. I think we could take that part of the question offline. But uh, beyond that, as far as the LTE deployment, Verizon has absolutely invested a lot of money into building out the LTE network across New York Metro, across New York City. Uh, most recently, as part of our deployment of the AWS Spectrum, or XLTE, uh, we deployed that in, in areas across the Northeast, and including New York City, to help bolster the capacity and the bandwidth across that LTE network as well. Is there a specific address in Queens? <laughs> <laughs> So Long Island City is absolutely a part of that footprint. Yes, there has there has been a uh, significant investment to that. Good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, one question over here, and then we'll head over to this side. 
Thank you. Uh, this would be a question for Mark. Um, in terms of establishing Queens as uh, the next digital Dumbo, which I see has basically been established for about a year, and that's up and coming, do you see uh, tech emerging into the five boroughs and then maybe a competition between the five boroughs where Queens could um, go ahead and win a competition, kind of like how Brian was mentioning for his company, and you know, establish Long Island City here as a hotbed that gets a lot of media attention? So, so it's a question, just do I think that Queens could establish itself? R right, like if, if you, um, if there were investments into all five boroughs and then, you know, getting those started, but Queens jumping ahead once those are on the table, kind of winning out, showing that it wins out. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think I think Queens has has a lot of great things going for it. Uh, you know, I, you know, again, there there it the, the the issues are are certainly more probably psychological than than real logistical because again, I would argue from a, you know from a lot of places it's actually more convenient than Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is obviously turned into a uh, you know has has a pretty strong tech scene down there. People don't even really think twice too much about a company being. Based in Brooklyn, whereas you know, I can tell you, ten, you know, probably ten years ago, maybe even less, maybe five years ago, it was still, you know, if you were in Brooklyn, that was like, you know, that was like, why, why you know, why, why would anyone be in Brooklyn? Um, and now it's, it's, you know, it's where all the cool kids hang out. So uh, Queens hopefully can be, you know, Queen maybe, you know, Queens is hopefully the new, the new Brooklyn in that respect. I think that, um, you know, I, I think just, just naturally, people started migrating to Brooklyn because it was. A lot cheaper than Manhattan, and there was a lot of cool spaces, and and um, you know it, it was also cheap from, from a living standpoint. So I think um, you know Queens is is has a lot of those same characteristics. Again, maybe doesn't yet have maybe there's some branding that needs to be done because it maybe doesn't have the quite the coolness factor that maybe Brooklyn has because it has you know it had the Brooklyn Dodgers and it had Coney Island and you know Queens has the Mets, which maybe is not quite as Sexy, <laughs> at least not right now. But you know, um, uh, but you know, I, I mean, but there are a lot of you know. Obviously, Queens has a lot of great things. There's a lot of great space. There's so much that can be done here. Uh, you know, if I were investing in real estate, um, you know, Queens would probably be the place to invest. I think. And you know, don't I'm not a real estate expert, so certainly don't <laughs> blame me. Don't go out and buy some uh, space. But but uh, but seriously, I mean, I think it is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of space here that is that is so convenient to to the city. And it's inexpensive, and there, there's a lot of great things going for it. So I, I would think if we're sitting here 10 years from now, it'll be, you know, maybe we'll be talking. But in 10 years from now, we'll be having the meeting in Staten Island. We'll be saying, well, you know, Queens became this cool thing. Now, how do we make Staten Island the next cool tech hotbed? Absolutely. And Staten Island tech meetup. Um, I got one question over here. Jolly, you're next. What's up? John, question? This is for Brian. Uh, so when you went out and you pitched investors for Series A, what was your what was your one metric that you like? You just did like dumb stuff down for investors. What was your one metric that you like pitched out? What did you highlight above all else in your Series A pitch process? Yeah, so I, you know I think we we were able to make the most impact probably with units deployed um, because it's really really hard to get uh, fifty connected devices out, um, you know, more broadly, you know, I really see this as a long-term, as a marketing play, um, you know, creating retail, coupling it with interactive media, extracting a lot of data, and I think the big pushback from investors is that to achieve that, it really needs to operate as a vending machine on its own, so people are, we're super uh, interested in just Retail revenue per machine per month, um, and you know we would always try to push as a secondary metric uh, touches of the screen per machine per month, uh, which we can actually translate into unique engagements. Does that answer your question? More or less. Okay, one more question here from Jolly. Hi. Um, in terms of the limited real estate. Um, what you see on the wall at most places now is the uh, jukebox, the internet-connected jukebox. Have you ever thought of partnering with a jukebox firm and then possibly partnering with a mafia who could go around and throw out other, all the other jukeboxes? Yeah, so you would think that I planted this question. Uh, we just partnered with TouchTunes, which is the biggest digital jukebox company. I've never met this guy in my life. 
but um, yeah, so it's we, this you know this company sort of has a well very mature connected device. They understand the bar channel, uh, so it's it's a nice fit for us. So we're launching a pilot program with them, um, probably in Philadelphia. And then is it my understanding that your all your devices are connected via Verizon Wireless? Is this is this? Yeah, correct? that's correct. So yeah. Is that a tariff rate for each device, or is it something that you've cooked up between you? <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. So don't Ver don't violate any non-disclosure agreements if if it comes to that. But. You got it. Uh, so, so Verizon was uh, they were all over us from the beginning. Um, they came to us, which was amazing. They have like a small to medium-sized army of people, um, and uh, so we buy the hotspots. And then we pay um, a attractive rate per month um, that sets a limit on the data usage and the overages we feel are very nicely so, priced. So not even unlimited data for these guys? No, Still no unlimited yeah. data from Verizon? Darn, OK. What's up with that? Well, here, here, here's, <laughs> here's an interesting question, actually, because you're turning every one of these into a hotspot. You know, can you turn it into Wi-Fi? Location of the spot is that on the roadmap for for other people? Yeah, I mean, if I want to swipe my credit card and get Wi-Fi for ten minutes, is that an option on any of these? Yeah. So one of the challenges that we face is that you know the needle has swung so so far towards digital. And there's so few people doing physical things. Like we've had the craziest amount of people come to us and be like, "Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you be an ATM for Bitcoin?" And it's like you know, it's it's very, very hard for us to stay focused, and we're doing so much from the locations, acquisition, to merchandising, to servicing, um, to developing new versions. It's very challenging. So we've sort of, you know, we, we've played around with a few ideas, and, you know, there's, there's some startups out there that are sort of doing the free Wi-Fi thing. Um, I know Karma is a New York-based one. We actually tried out their their solution before uh, going with Verizon. Um, so we're trying to sort of find that balance of like playing, but also keeping the core um, value to the consumer really clear that it's a store, that it's a vending machine. So it's it's, it's tricky. Okay, I specifically to the point that Karma does not use Verizon's network, so that might give you some insight into why they went with Verizon. Um, that being said, could you speak a little bit about how Verizon first got involved? Like, what was the form of internet connectivity these things used before Verizon was involved? At, and, and at what stage, like in what hardware version did you incorporate the first Verizon modem? Yeah, so at first, uh, like if you've ever, I'm sure there's a lot of startup people here with their own companies. If you've ever reached out to a big company, it's like generally pretty useless. Um, so we actually didn't even bother reaching out to Verizon. Uh, we partnered with Karma for a little. We used these clear hubs that were just like off the shelf and really simple. Um, and once we got our, after the prototype, we did a batch of 10 second generation Bengos. Once we got them out, um, Verizon came to us. Uh, they came out to Long Island City and um, presented us with, with some solutions and we got it going immediately, figured out how to integrate it into the device, um, and uh, we got it going. Great, okay. So um, unless we have one more question, you'll notice that our fireplace has officially gone out. So I think um, we, are, we are towards the end of the evening. We have time for one more question, if anyone uh, is one last dying question. Question, anybody? One last question, not about Fios, I hope. For Brian, um, how tough are those things? How tough Did are they? Someone try to crack one open. Did someone tried to like swipe one. Like yeah, fair question. You guys um, have expensive, you know, items. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that's one of the challenges, right, of being in the physical. Uh, you have to deal with people, and the screens on these are are vulnerable. Um, I think we've lost one screen so far, which is not too bad. Um, and so our new generation is like a commercial grade LCD um, with Gorilla Glass. It's a little tougher. Um, the box is 90 thou thick aluminum, which is pretty tough. Um, 
we, with the new ones, we did the pull-up test, which is where you do a pull-up on the machine mounted to a wall, and that worked. And uh, so yeah, so it's, it's getting improved. It's, it'll never be like perfect. Uh, there'll always be like a way to invent some sort of machine to destroy our machine, but it's, it's getting there. Great, okay, so that about does it for the first Queen's Tech Speaker Series. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. Um, in case you don't know, this program you're here right now um, experiencing is a program of Coalition for Queens. Um, Juke spoke briefly about C4Q at the beginning. In case you're not familiar, C4Q is a nonprofit economic development corporation we're all about making this area and New York as a whole, you know, the best place in the world to start a company um, and empower the people here already to help contribute to that effort. So um, everyone who paid a ticket price tonight, completely 100% tax deductible, and your money is going to go to support um, the next class of our access code development training program. Um, if you're familiar with Flatiron School or Dev Boot Camp, you know, these are very expensive, intensive boot camps where you go in and you come out 12 or 15 weeks later with all the skills to become an entry-level iOS programmer. Um, usually they run 10 to $15,000. Um, last summer we ran a pilot program for 21 students. Um, average tuition around 800 bucks. Many paid nothing at all. Um, and many of them are now working as developers, in fact. A couple of them quadrupled their income. Um, so that's the program that your money, that this organization um, is supporting. Um, I hope you all stay involved with us. Come back to the next Queen's Tech Meetup, which be, uh, should be sometime next month. Stay tuned for details. If, if you join the group today, you're automatically on our mailing list, and, and you'll get those blasts. Um, I think you can probably expect something around the last Tuesday of next month. Um, and also, save the date for October 15th, Wednesday, October 15th. Um, that is the second annual Queen's Tech Bash um, at PS1 MoMA. Um, we're going to have a very killer party. We started this tradition last year. Um, we rent out the whole dome in the front area in the courtyard. We roasted a whole pig last year. We had incredible food from dozens of, not dozens, but lots of uh, um, uh, Queens food purveyors. Um, we hope to see you all there. Uh, we hope to raise a big pile of money um, to help uh, you know, continue to build the community here and empower uh, underserved communities in Queens with, with the skills they need to contribute to the tech economy. So thank you, everybody. Again, my name is Aaron Cohen. Um, if you would do us the huge favor of taking your chair and stacking it in the corner on your way out. It's the way you can contribute to Queens Tech one more time today. So thank you, everybody.